Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C., and thanks for joining us today in our monthly series. It's the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. Uh, this month, we are covering subcontracting. Uh, so this webinar series, as I mentioned, is the second Friday of every month. It runs for about an hour and a half. Uh, our speakers will present a little bit of content and as they're speaking, you can type in your questions on the right-hand side. You should see a control panel uh, with a question box. Uh, we won't interrupt their presentation, so we will take your questions uh, at the uh, end of the presentations, uh, at the end of all four presentations. Everything is being recorded, so if you paid for registration today, you will receive the MP4. Uh, you can always find the PowerPoints for this webinar and 400 plus others on our slideshare.net site. Those are all complimentary downloads. So as I mentioned, this is a monthly series. Uh, January, uh, we covered cybersecurity, February OTAs, bid protests and teaming agreements. Now we're on to subcontracting. Uh, June, the second Friday, we're going to cover sales and capture. Uh, and then the second half of the year are uh, other topics that you can see here listed on your screen. If you want to register for any of those, you can go to our website and navigate to the tab at the top that says Q&A Cafe. Uh, and you'll have the links there as well as um, links for the past as well as these upcoming uh, webinars. So just a quick blurb about us. Uh, we do provide consulting services for federal contractors, most notably known for GSA schedules, uh, but also provide assistance with market analysis reports, proposal writing, pricing, and other services that you see here on the screen. We've got a newsletter that goes out every Monday and hits over 23,000 federal government contractors. We're running a special this month in May. Uh, your ad can run anytime throughout 2021, uh, but the month of May, uh, again, it has a, an additional volume discount built in for anyone ordering an ad that's three weeks long or more. Uh, if you've got questions or you want to get specific pricing from us or a quote, just send us an email to the hello at jennifershouse.com address. Uh, some other upcoming events and webinars that we've got. Uh, every Wednesday for any defense contractors out there, we cover every part of the DFARS through uh, relationships that we have with guest speakers. Most uh, tend to be government contracts attorneys and we go sequentially through each part of the DFARS. They run about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, they're complimentary, they're all recorded, they're on our website. Uh, and then in 2020, so last year we covered the FAR, uh, same cadence, uh, it was every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Those are all complimentary, recorded, and on our website. At the end of this month, uh, the week before uh, Memorial Day weekend, we're gonna cover uh, the GSA schedule. Uh, what's in it for you? That's with our friends at the Virginia PTAC. June 10th, uh, in association with FedMine, we're covering GSA and focus, uh, requirements, focus, and power. And July 1st, uh, I'll be speaking with the Catalyst Center in regards to marketing and messaging for GovCons. These are all listed on our website under the events section. Please note these are all virtual. Uh, all you need is an internet connection to log on to these, and I believe they are all complimentary. So we want to thank uh, the Virginia PTAC for sponsoring this series, the monthly Q&A Cafe. Uh, they are a great resource for startups as well as burgeoning government contractors that want one-on-one -on -one counseling and training. Uh, we also want to thank Crown Castle. Uh, they're a, they are a sponsor also of this uh, series for the entire year. Uh, they're a, an IT provider. John Kipfer is the main contact. If you've got questions about their services, uh, his contact information is there in the right-hand corner. Okay, with uh, all the commercials there, we are have arrived at what we're going to cover today, which is uh, the topic of subcontracting. We want to thank our speakers. They took a lot of time, uh, prep calls, putting together uh, PowerPoint slides, and really just uh, working with each other to present great content for you guys today. So we have uh, going to go through some introductions first, and then uh, we'll get into the content. So William Randolph, uh, former government uh, employee, and he runs Think Acquisition. He's got a lot of great videos out there if you follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know if it's daily. It seems like you've Maybe you do these daily, but uh, a lot of great uh, acquisition 
uh, tips for contractors. Uh, also, we've got Whitney Stoll from Cribworks. Uh, he's worked for some major companies in, uh, in Capture and really understands the subcontracting process as well. Emily Harmon, uh, also former government uh, employee, and she has a uh, awesome coaching and consulting business. Uh, you'll hear her perspective uh, as well. And John Planky, who's over at PCI, uh, they're a training organization. He's a government contracts attorney, so you'll get your legal uh, answers uh, from John. So again, I want to thank them for uh, participation of their time, and I'm going to turn it over to William. So William, the floor is yours. Just let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Thank you so very much, Jennifer. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, as a result of my 26 years being on the federal government side, as a contract specialist, contracting officer, and then senior procurement executive in a couple of organizations. I've had a lot, many opportunities to have conversations around subcontracting. Uh, most of them have often needed to be measured because of one primary uh, doctrine, if you will, and the doctrine of privity of contract, understanding that the federal government cannot confer rights or impose obligations on an entity, an organization or a government or a firm that it doesn't have a contract with. So when you think about that the government awards contracts to prime contractors, that means that that privity of contract is that, is that contractual business relationship between the government and the prime, and it does not exist, that same privity of contract does not exist between the government contracting officer and subcontractors. Okay, so that is a very, very important concept to understand and appreciate uh, because there's been many times where I have uh, I have felt that subcontractors wanted to come in and have a or came in and wanted to have a conversation about something that was going on amiss or untoward in their opinion in their business relationship with their prime. But we were very much reluctant um, and, and did not have the ability to have those conversations. So as a result of that, I always think about, well, what does that mean to the federal government contractor? And that is, and particularly in the, in the small business situation, is that you have to own your business, your, your own, you have to own your business relationship. It's really, really important to understand what you're getting into and then what the expectations and obligations of those relationships are. Next, please. So what does that look like? That mean, that looks like negotiating your agreements well before the work shows up, okay? When there's an expectation, set the expectation of work, work share, responsibility, accountability, expectations, doing all of the activity with between subs and primes to make sure that those relationships have been on some level matured and understand under, and understood and making sure that the expectations are met one of the greatest thing, one of the greatest challenges i have seen in my experience is this the unrealistic expectations or unmet expectations because they were never aligned in the first place while there are agreements and contracts and teaming agreements and partnership agreements that the, the paper and the people had two different things in mind. So what should that look like? That should look like the activity that is taken early on in the process to make sure you understand from a, from a subcontractor position, what is gonna be expected of you and knowing that the government will not be able to interfere from a standpoint of, of assessing those relationships. There's one nuance, and you'll probably hear a little bit more about that because one of my colleagues, one of the colleagues on the webinar uh, is an expert in the space of small business subcontracting in terms of goals and targets. One of the things the government may be able to lean into a little bit is the terms and condition around small business subcontracting and, and measuring the goals and the, and the targets that are in the contract. Those are terms and conditions of the contract and the contracting officer as a, as a steward of the government 
absolutely has the responsibility and and the ability to affect change in that space but outside of small business subcontracting as measured by the goals and objectives or targets in the contract uh, that is a very um, measured piece of activity that the government can lean into next so knowing that that's a very interesting dynamic and that the government will not be able to lean into that activity, I always like, like to leave people with opportunities uh, to think about how, how do we overcome those things. One of the things that I've done, especially in my experiences now on the other side of the table as a government contractor, is how do you find, how do you strategically find and secure those meaningful, thoughtful, and engaged subcontracts that will not only give you experiences, but the holy grail of past performance. And there's a strategy that I have used uh, and that I have matured over the last couple of years that I call Hunt, Fish, and Farm. Hunt, Fish, and Farm is simply a three-tiered approach of thinking about how do you engage, how do you become top of mind in your industry, in your area, in your vertical, so that the primes that are actually doing and, and, and capturing prime level work know you exist in the space. Hunting is very simply understanding who's doing what, finding targets, and then shooting on those targets from a standpoint of being very targeted and being very active and engaged in finding, finding opportunities and being very engaged in, in, in hunting and shooting on those targets. There's a, there's a degree of, just like regular hunting, there's a degree of risk and there's a degree of luck in that environment. But in a hunting environment, you absolutely can deliver on finding or, or, or putting effort on specific targets. Fishing is much more about a one-to-many scenario, thinking about putting multiple hooks in the water or having opportunities where you can make your business, your whatever you're coming to market with, your whatever you're deploying and bringing to the marketplace, making sure multiple people, multiple companies in your vertical know you exist. So those fishing opportunities look like webinars, speaking engagements, collaborative activities, doing training, doing development, doing free, doing free webinars, doing blog posts, LinkedIn, you name it. Anywhere where you can get to a, instead of a one-to-one, -one, use a one-to-many approach to become known in your space. Once you're known and become top of mind, then those primes will come looking for you. The last, but certainly not least, is what I call farming. And farming is really about cultivating the relationships. Once you've done the hunting and once you've done the fishing and you've made connections with those primes in your vertical or other subcon smaller subcontractors in your vertical, in the space you've chosen, chosen to live in and go to market in, once you've made those connections, then you need to foster those relationships. And that means planting the seeds, planting the relationship seeds and cultivating those relationships so that people know you are active in the space, you're engaged, you're, you wanna connect, you wanna be involved, and all of that activity is really cultivating a relationship that will then return an ROI, an ROI, a return on that investment some point in the future. Three levels, hunting, very opportunistic, fishing, very intentional, and farming is kind of the long way, a, a, the longer version of cultivating relationships. Thank you. Great. And Whitney, over to you. Great, that was uh, very well done, William. And uh, I think that really leads into what I'm gonna be discussing more on the sales side. Uh, but uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the opportunity. Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna really discuss uh, the subcontracting more from a sales and capture perspective. And uh, I'm really gonna focus on three uh, main areas. One from a large or a prime contractor, then a subcontractor, and as well as tools available. So that's really the basis of, uh, of what I'm gonna focus on. And a couple of questions uh, really to keep in mind uh, throughout the, the next couple of slides are, are for you is to really look at how well you and your company are really connected with your current client base, really from a subcontracting standpoint. 
as well as, you know, do you and your organization really have subcontracting goals? You know, are you proactively looking for subcontracting opportunities or is it more reactive when uh, a company actually comes to you and says, hey, we want you to be a subcontractor? So things to think about as we as we go through this. So I definitely think if you are a small business or you're a subcontractor, I always think it's key to know like what goes through the mind of a prime contractor, because if you understand a little bit of what they uh, are focusing on, I think it makes you a little bit more dangerous and a little bit more uh, the ability to talk to a prime, be like, all right, I want to be a subcontractor uh, with current prime. So the thing to think about at the prime contractor, you know, I, I broke it down into three areas, looking at, you know, captures and proposals, also marketing opportunities, as well as looking at timelines. So uh, as, as we know in proposals, you know, there's always the written requirements is, you know, what you're going to get be uh, judged on as well. There's always the written requirements. There's also the unwritten requirements, you know, in, in large proposals, you know, you're going to have a small business uh, requirement, you know, that might be say, you know, 18% of a, of a potential uh, contract has to go to small business. It could also be unwritten requirements. You know, there might be, depending on how close you are with your current client, they might want a lot more. So it's it's really understanding of, from a of prime, is, is there opportunities really to be able to talk with the prime, say, I can really help you meet those goals. So really understanding really how, where you are with your, uh, with your client, as well as your prime, you can help them meet those goals. The other part is, you know, prime really look at how the competitors and the competition are, are lined up. Are subcontractors really, you know, doing a lot of work that you need a current sub on your team as well? Understanding the levels of competition, I think, are critical because you might want some of a sub on your team as well as you go after work. So looking at competition, I think, is key uh, and how you can be a very critical uh, teammate for, for prime. Uh, and where you can also gain a competitive edge of uh, being, being on any team, uh, as well as, as looking at, you know, evaluation factors. Is subcontracting really that important or is it not? So really looking at, at that, as those aspects of captures and as a proposal. And as a capture manager, I always look at, can subcontracting be a very critical point of how I can actually build out a very strong subcontracting team? I worked on proposals in the past where I know that if I had a very, very strong uh, subcontracting team, that would really benefit me and a lot of uh, some of the proposals I did work on. Uh, one aspect I think that could always be built out is stakeholder mapping. And from a prime, they want to know everybody from the source selection board to if, there, if it's a large project, uh, down to all the policy makers, you know, how well uh, the end users, as well as people involved in the procurement process, how important that is to subcontracting as well. So that's what a lot of primes will be thinking about is how well they know everybody and is are they even thinking about subcontracting as well. So this is what goes through some of their minds. Uh, from a marketing aspect, uh, a lot of primes, I think, got to be able to leverage their supplier portals. And if you're a subcontractor, are you even in some of the, uh, the supplier portal of a large business? So definitely getting your name out there and leveraging yourself from a social media standpoint or even just on their website as well. So really trying to build your exposure. Uh, and then from a past performance uh, perspective, you know, does what you do reflect uh, what a prime might need as well? You know, are you just, uh, are you really pinpointing the, the potential customer uh, that you want to be going after, you know, where does, um, are you showing off your work as well? So some of those things you really should be, uh, be considering looking at your past performance, uh, and looking at, at, at timelines as well. You know, a lot of primes will, do you need to be used for the, uh, for submission of the proposal or do they need you afterwards being proactive and actually getting your subcontracting team on prior to the uh, to the proposals uh, submission is always a, uh, a great idea. We all know that towards the end of the fiscal year, there's always a lot of interest in getting subcontractors on. Uh, you know, can you actually start that process earlier rather than, you know, going into a fire drill late in the year? So there's things to think about always being proactive in, in what you do. So uh, next slide. And then from a subcontractor, 
uh, uh, point of view, here are some of the things that uh, to consider. Uh, one of the ones is what's your differentiator as a company? You know, why should a prime work with you? It's uh, you know just because you're a, an 8A company that does you know health IT services, uh, you know, so what? Like, show me something that why you are a differentiator. Like, give me something so you can you can really talk to a prime on like why they should pick you and why you can be so valuable to them as a team. Like separate yourself from everybody else. That sometimes that takes a little bit of working through, but like what is your differentiator as a company? And what are your core competencies? Like sell into the markets where you really have a lot of value and you can really separate yourself from the, uh, from the rest of the, the competition. I think that's something everybody should really be considering. As well as where is your past performance? You know, you know, where can you do relatable work at an agency or a prime contractor? They would find a lot of value. So I think understanding that as an internal planning uh, is really critical for you to really set a target and understand where you can have a subcontracting plan to be able to move forward. And then looking at planning and marketing, you know, do you have a targeted list of prime contractors that you or and within specific agencies that you want to go after. You know, are you shooting yourself incredibly wide, be like, I want to go here, here, and here? Or do you have a targeted list, like this is who I want to go after, these are the agencies, you know, identifying the primes and then starting a, a you know a campaign to reach out to them. You know, how how are you actually currently lined up to actually approach them? So, and then from there you can start a list of like, all right, here's how we reach out. You know, how do we reach out through your social media accounts, through LinkedIn and other aspects? So I think planning and being able to market yourself is a critical aspect to defining uh, a good subcontracting plan. And then there's lots of tools available, you know, uh, making sure you, not only you, but your company is also part of trade associations. This could be, you know, if you're doing a lot of work in, um, in the Army, you know, you're part of AUSA, the Association of the United States Army, uh, part of the Society of American Military Engineers, or uh, you know, the National 8A Association. Are you part of those associations? Because being a part of those are a great way to meet the people who are always looking for uh, for uh, subcontractors and be able to have those relationships. Uh, another way to look at where companies are are uh, are doing a lot of subcontracting is also some of the market intelligence tools will tell you where teams are doing well, but also where agencies are trying to hit their subcontracting. Uh, requirements or the small and as well as their small business goals you know Bloomberg and GovWin are great tools if your company can afford it and as well as looking at social media pages you know a lot of companies will talk about all the opportunities or all the companies are teaming with as well uh, and the last one I put on there is LinkedIn LinkedIn is a great resource for you to be able to reach out to uh, to companies to primes to program managers and it's a great way to network and and uh, reach out to, to people if you want to actually talk about subcontracting opportunities. So in a nutshell, great way to, to reach out to primes and the subs. Uh, and that's all I have for now. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Whitney. And Emily, over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm excited to be here. I remember, I think it was over a year ago, you said, do you want to be on this panel? So time flies. You, yes. you schedule your panels way far out, so that's awesome. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight before I get into my slide is that I just did a LinkedIn Live with Judy Bratt, and we talked about sales. And you can go to my LinkedIn um, page and find that um, Onward podcast interview. But a lot of the tips she shared in there would apply to you know the things that um, William's talking about about hunt fish and farm and you know all the things that it takes to build relationships um, and to you know find subcontracting opportunities. What I wanted to talk about is some recent audit reports on subcontracting. Um, my, my last position with the um, federal government, I was the director of the Office of Small Business Programs for the Department of the Navy, which is the Navy and the Marine Corps. And at that time, when I was in that office, you know, subcontracting was starting to become something that these uh, auditors were, were looking into. And you can see the first um, 
bullet that I have up there is this DODIG small business subcontracting at two Army contracting locations. And it says there that that's the fourth and last audit in a series of DODIG audits. And there were some audits in that series on the Marine Corps that I know about as well. So um, it's just good to understand when you're doing business with different organizations, what's the culture there? What are they thinking about with respect to subcontracting? And these audits can tell you some of the things that they're focused on. So you can just search on that audit title and you can find this uh, short report. I'll just read a couple of um, highlights from it. And basically they looked at Redstone and Warren and they said that, for um, 27 out of 50 contracts that the officials insured, contracting officials ensured that prime contractors provided small businesses with adequate opportunities. But on 23 um, of those 50 contracts, um, and the, those 23 were valued at just under a billion dollars, um, they did not provide adequate uh, uh, subcontracting opportunities. Um, and you can read in there, you know, some more detail on that, but if that's telling you that, you know, out of that sample of 50, 23, they didn't provide the opportunities and um, basically they didn't monitor the prime's compliance with subcontracting plans. Um, they didn't determine um, why prime contractors with individual subcontracting plans didn't meet their small business subcontracting goals. So they weren't really monitoring it. So, you know, they were putting it in the contracts, meeting that requirement, but then they weren't monitoring it. And it says here that this occurred, the, the Redstone and Warren officials said that this occurred because contracting officials did not understand subcontracting plan requirements and because administering subcontracting plans was not a high priority. And they also had high turnover in contracting officers. And I can tell you that, that the, those findings, um, you know, apply pretty much, you know, I didn't work at every government agency, but they do pretty much apply. I mean, we have, there's high con, there's high turnover among the contracting staff. And also I would say that subcontracting is kind of like a hot potato. Um, the contracting officers are responsible for putting the requirement in the contract, but they have so many other things. The buck stops at the contracting officer for so many other things and, and at the technical rep for so many other things, like making sure the work's getting done, uh, the deadlines are being met, the billing's being done, um, that sometimes subcontracting uh, falls by the wayside. So being aware of that and whatever your organization you're working for, just understanding that and and maybe talking about it with the subcontracting, uh, with the um, small business professionals or even the contracting professionals, you know, what are you doing to, what are they doing to take action on these audits? Um, GAO also did a study and um, GAO made 10 recommendations for ensuring procedures for SBA PCR reviews are followed, that contractor subcontracting reports are monitored and reviewed and that SBA um, compliance reviews are clearly documented. So what is the SBA PCR? Well, the Small Business Administration has a procurement center representative. There's not enough to go around for one at each command. So they're really understaffed. Sometimes I know when I worked at the Naval Air Systems Command, the SBA employee there also reviewed subcontracting plans and, and acquisitions for many other organizations. Um, so it wasn't just solely focused on NAVAIR, but they are responsible for reviewing these subcontracting plans as well and signing off on them, and they didn't always do that. So GAO made some uh, 10 recommendations. They're basically saying that for 14 of the 26 contracts that they reviewed, Contracting officers did not ensure that the contractors submitted required subcontracting reports. And for about half of the 26 contracts, they couldn't demonstrate that the procedures for the PCR were followed. And there's some recommendations in here regarding um, policy and things like that. And, you know, you'll see recommendations for, you know, making sure that what's in the subcontracting plan is what the contractor is reporting against because when they submit a proposal they submit a subcontracting plan that says a certain percent is going to be subcontracted out but then sometimes when they submit their report let's say they said we're going to subcontract 25 percent to small business but when they submit their report they might put in there that their goal was 14 percent so basically they're saying the contracting officer needs to look and make sure that the report what the contractor is holding them 
themselves accountable to is what they said they were going to do when they submitted the proposal. So all these things need to be to be looked at. Um, next chart, please. Um, I'm not going to go into the Department of Energy, but I can tell you that it's very similar findings. And now you'll see that the there's a project announcement out um, where the Department of Defense um, IG is determining whether this is a little different. They're looking at small business set-asides and sole source contracts to small businesses, making sure that the small businesses that are the primes are complying with the established limitation, subcontracting limitations, okay? So there's, you know, there's a limit on the amount of work that a small business can subcontract out. And the purpose for that is they don't want it to be a front. Um, it's not a good news story when you see that a small business is the prime, but the large, that's the sub, is doing a large percent, like in the 90s or 80s percent of the work. And that's been, that's made the paper in the past. So, you know, subcontracting goes both ways. The smalls need to be doing the majority of the work um, and and prime, large primes need to be subcontracting out to small businesses. And all of that needs to be monitored. And um, I think that this audit on uh, the DOD, IG audit um, on DOD um, is interesting. And, and um, I'm, you know, I would recommend following it to see what they, what they discover, but especially with um, best in class contracts and larger contracts being awarded um, to small businesses um, they're going to be looking to make sure that the smalls can do that work and they're not relying on a prime to do most of the work, a large business. Um, next. Question. So the other thing that I wanted to point out is, um, in addition to paying attention to the, the current climate with respect to audits and what's going on there, um, is to pay attention to the Federal Register. Um, the Federal Register is where announcements are made about different policy changes. And you can see sometimes it takes a while for these announcements to come through because this one um, that I put up there, the, the deadline to comment is, is passed, but it's implementing the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2017. So it takes a while when laws are passed for them to be implemented in the FAR. But in order to implement them in the FAR, the federal government it has to go out and get public comment. And so, you know, sometimes they get a lot of comments, sometimes they don't get any, but it's kind of like voting. Um, you, you know, if you don't vote, then don't complain. <laughs> if you don't submit, you know, comments on how to improve the regulation, um, you're not helping yourself or other companies. So it's just something to pay attention to. And if you're a member of, you know, a trade organization or something like that, usually they collect comments from you know, those companies that are in their organization and submit them as a, as a group. But those are just all things to um, pay attention to, to understand the overall subcontracting climate. And that's all I have. Great, good to know those, uh, those regs. And John, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. And for those of you on the West Coast, good morning. Um, I'm gonna go over some flow down basics here to start with. Um, so contract clauses, often get included both in their prime contract and then again in their subcontracts and then again in lower tier subcontracts. And these are flow downs. Um, they're usually FAR clauses in government contracting. And there'll be something in the FAR that says you have to put this clause in your contract and then the clause itself will say, oh, and you have to put it in the subcontract. Um, it's important that you include your flow downs for a couple of reasons. One, you told the government that you're going to do it but also they carry a lot of the compliance things that you are bound by. And going back to uh, William's uh, privity point, this is, this is how government, the government includes their compliance requirements, even though they don't have privity with your subcontractors. <clears throat> but there's also a performance element to it. Uh, th this is how you get, this is how you actually have your subcontractors doing the right things in the right way by including your requirements in your subcontracts. It's pretty straightforward, uh, next. Uh, and so flow downs tend to take two forms. You have the mandatory flow downs, and these are things where the contract itself says, you have to flow this down, like the cybersecurity requirements. If you have a cybersecurity requirement and somebody is 
and you have a subcontractor that has the kind of IT that needs the cybersecurity requirements, you are required to include the cybersecurity clause. But there are also voluntary flow downs, things that are either silent on the issue of being flowed down or are not silent but not required. Um, these are things that are probably prudent to flow down. You And think like the changes clause. You don't have to include the changes clause in your subcontracts, but you should. Um, and so when you flow down a clause, you need to look at the clause and see what it says in the FAR. If it's a mandatory flow down, it will tell you, hey, you need to flow me down as I'm written, or you need to adapt me to your contract, or you just need to flow down the general requirements. It, it's different from the clause. So open up the FAR, look at the clause, and read, see how it says to do it. For your voluntary flow downs, you're not going to you're not going to need to do that uh, because obviously you they're your requirements that you want them because they're in your contract, but you're not required by law to do it or by the, your contract to do it. So you don't necessarily have to. But the important lesson here is read the clauses, think about them, and then include them. Next. I moved through this much very quickly, sorry. Which brings us to our best practices. So when you are looking at so when you're looking at your, your clauses that you might be flowing down or you need to flow down, once again, look at the FAR. Think about how it should be flowed down. Think about what requirements this clause creates for you and how that interacts with your subcontractors. Um, so read the FAR and then stay up to date on updating the government contracts field. So uh, if, you are a, if you're a member of the NCMA and you get NCMA, um, Contract Management Magazine. Uh, don't just leave it. Don't just leave it on your kitchen table. Actually, open it up and read it. It's got some good stuff in there. Uh, same thing if you're a member of the uh, the DC Bar Government Contracts uh, Group. Uh, they, they have publications. The ABA has publications. Uh, Jennifer Schaas and Associates has newsletters. Actually, read those. They have information in them that is actually helpful. Um, you know, attend programs like this where we talk about updates and that kind of thing will. Get, get it moving in your mind to help you along there. And then have people you can ask. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not actually practicing for clients at the moment much, but have a lawyer you can talk to about these things. Have an accountant. Uh, if you need help with you know, knowing the market, you know there are consultants like Jennifer Schoss, there are salespeople, there are people you should, so consult with experts, people who know what they're doing to help you with these because they're, a lot of these things are fiddly and they, they're easy to mess up. Next. Okay, great. So we have uh, covered the content from each of our panelists who each offer a, a different perspective on uh, various aspects of subcontracting. So we're going to run through a couple questions that they wanted to, uh, to be asked just in order to help spur your questions. And again, feel free to type those in on the right hand side. I do see a couple coming in. Um, so, William, I'm going to first. Uh, up over to you. Uh, what's the easiest subcontracting opportunity targeting strategy that you have run across? Is is there an easy button? There is indeed an easy button. Uh, the easy button for me and for uh, for many of the GovCons that I interact with and coach is to use betasam.gov and the award notifications. Okay, think about what has transpired from the time that a a company submits a proposal. Think about the time frame that has gone through that's often counted in months, okay? Until there's an award decision, let's say that's four months later, and now the, the prime has won the award, but do you think that the team that submitted the proposal is still together or all the people are still there or all the people that they thought about? That's a prime opportunity to interject your value proposition to someone that's a won a contract. Okay, you, it, you know, you you go past all of the bidding competition. At that point, you know who the winner is, and and that is an opportunity to reach out to those new awardees when everybody's eye on the win but maybe the team is still not constituted the way it was three, four, or five months ago, there could be an opportunity to sneak in on a win and provide your goods and services. In my opinion, I think that's a, a major easy button, and I've actually used it twice 
and actually won some work on teams that I was not even a part of in the very beginning. Great, thank you. And uh, Whitney, where can I find opportunities to subcontract on? Or if you're a prime, where can I find subcontractors? Well, I, I'm gonna, uh, I'd say William probably hit it out of the park. I think that's, that, that is the, uh, the golden, golden area. Uh, and I also do work at the state and local, local level. And you can also do that, this, apply the same technique on state and local bid boards uh, as well. So if you if you're doing work at state and local level, you could still do the same thing. Find the contract awardee, and and apply the same thing. So I'd recommend doing that. Uh, and then the other part you can go is go to the SBA subnet. The SBA subnet is another area where you can also find uh, uh, potential uh, opportunities as well as subcontractors as well. And I will will go back to. Uh, my point I made earlier is what's your company's, you know, subcontracting, what do you as your company want to do? So I think that's just tailoring that of what your company wants to do. And but then once you figure that out, you'll be able to find opportunities anywhere you go. Great. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to add a best practice in here. Uh, we always recommend that small businesses, if there is a prime that you want to subcontract with, that you go to their website first. They usually have a portal for you to register because as soon as you contact uh, whoever the small business liaison is, uh, that's the first thing they're going to ask you or they'll tell you, go to our website and register. So you may as well do that in advance, show that you're kind of a step ahead of the game and, uh, and kind of check that box off. And Emily, over to you. Uh, how are small businesses opposed, supposed to find time to submit comments under cases announced in the Federal Register. We have enough on our plate. Um, yeah, I can I can see that. You know, I used to work for the federal government and be telling uh, small businesses what they need to do. And now I'm a small business owner myself. And I know that it's really tough, uh, especially when you only are one person, you know, how do you how do you get it done? So I think that um, you don't have to submit comments for every case. I think being part of a organization like NDIA or you know some other trade organization that has a small business committee that can submit comments on your behalf. But um, I think that it's kind of like if you don't have, if you've got to make the time, especially on things that are really important. Like the one, I think that the one that I just recommended is important because I mean it's already passed, but. I would keep an eye on that one because they're talking about, you know, how do they make sure that the large primes have a good faith effort um, in, you know, implementing subcontracting? And that's what I got complaints on a lot is, you know, I was proposed by this prime and they never used me and I don't think they're meeting their goals. What is a good faith effort? So, hopefully okay, great. Yeah. And uh, John, how do I flow down the requirements in the terminations clause? So this is this is the I guess the applied version of my slides on how to apply what I said earlier. And so the terminations clause is an interesting one because the terminations clause allows the government to terminate you for convenience, the government's convenience, and that means that they can terminate you for any reason that seems good to them. And so that appears in your prime contract. <sighs> you as the prime that's not a mandatory flow down so you don't have to include that in your subcontracts but you should but if you're a sub and I, if i recall correctly most of this audience is mostly subcontracting most of the time if you're a sub you don't want the terminations clause flow down to you verbatim you don't want to be terminated you don't want your prime to be able to terminate you for anything that seems convenient to them you want them to be able to terminate you only as much as the government has uh has terminated your prime so you know if you are providing it services or better example if you're pa painting buildings and the government has changed or partially terminated the contract so there are fewer buildings um, and you are providing paint uh, the government, you know, your prime should be able to say, well, I don't need as much paint anymore. So I'm going to terminate either fully or partially terminate that part of our contract. Um, and so you, that's how you want it flow down. But of course, the prime would absolutely love to get the full-blooded terminations clause flowed down to their subs. And you as a sub might want to try to do that to your lower tier subcontractor. So you want, you need to negotiate with your prime 
on how best to do that. And if you are a sub who has the ability to push back against having a full fat terminations clause or full fat changes clause or full fat any of these big definitional clauses, flow danger, do push back on that and see if you can limit it to just changing or terminating your contract as far as the government has done it to the prime. And that's one of the easiest ways for a really eager subcontractor to get kind of messed with by their prime is to have these big clauses flowed down full fat. Thank you. Great, thanks, John. And William, uh, how do most COs deal with subcontracting relationships? So in my experience, and I can only talk about my experiences and those of the teams that I have led over the years, uh, we often encourage those to be arm's length relationships. You know, out again, outside of if it is small business subcontracting and there are goals and targets in the contract that are then uh, turned into turn that are that show up as terms and conditions into the contract that the contracting officer can actually enforce, influence and enforce. Most of those other relationships are going to be uh, when under contract, they're going to be arm's length relationships. However, outside of those under contract relationships, uh, I am I am thankful that I'm beginning to see uh, a lot more conversations being had. And I think this is one of the unintended uh, gifts of the pandemic is that relationships, people are being, a, being able to connect a lot easier you know, for a 20 minute Zoom or Teams call than they did well before when you had to get through multiple levels of gatekeepers and make sure that the that the uh, that your your schedules matched and that you weren't bumped for something else that came up. Uh, I'm seeing people land meetings and land conversations that they may have never, never had an opportunity to do pre pandemic. So uh, while I know, you know, the pandemic has thrown some things askew. Uh, there is a new norm in the space of being able to ha harvest the relation, build and harvest uh, a value on relationships. And I will encourage people to take every opportunity that they can to, uh, to, to do that. Great. Thank you. And Whitney, what are a few ways to network to find ideal subcontracting opportunities? Sure. So this is a uh, don't be afraid to ask and and reach out and start networking you know reach out to your existing customers that you are currently doing work with or you recently did work with and talk to talk to them about uh you know what you want to do talk about subcontracting opportunities and start the dialogue you know reach out to where you're currently geographically doing work and start to really you know ask some of the regional uh you know the federal small business offices you know ask them you know who's doing the work and then start connecting with the primes in the in the area so it's really start to just start to network with you know the government as well as the primes in the areas that you want to do work start and start having that conversation around subcontracting the other part is is use leverage linkedin to your advantage uh, i think that's a very powerful tool that can really help you if you have access to linkedin sales navigator you don't i highly recommend sales navigator because that can be uh i think it's linked in on steroids so uh that can really help you pinpoint the exact people you want to reach out to and uh that will really help you even more and lastly uh, uh trade associations they can connect you to the right people reaching out to their board of directors those trade associations in your area of ex uh your field of expertise uh, they can, they're there for a reason. They're a small, they have a small business chair. They have uh, people that are there to help you connect with them, be a part of the association, but be active in those associations. And they can really be able to connect the dots for you. Uh, so that, that's, those are my kind of my, my recommendations. I can go on and on, but I'll keep it short. That, okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll second that on the associations, uh, especially for, uh, organizations that have a set aside status. Uh, there's WIPP, which is WIPP, Women Impacting Public Policy. So if you're women owned, even if you're not woman owned and you want to partner with a woman owned company, uh, that's a great way to, to get in there and network. Um, NDIA, I know Emily, you mentioned that. Um, FCA, AUSA, I mean, there's hundreds of organizations. You just need to find the one that aligns with your company and be an active member. Get on a committee, whether it's membership or 
something along those lines where you're going to be um, exposed to more intimate uh, relationships with the other committee members. And that's how things happen. That's how relationships start. So uh, great points that you guys made. Uh, and Emily, uh, based on your experience as a government employee, what policy changes do you recommend that would increase subcontracting opportunities for small businesses? Um, so what I would say is what I've observed, at least working for the in the Department of Defense, is that there's really not one belly button, one person that's overall responsible for subcontracting or at least views themselves as that way. So, you know, and, and there's challenges, which I can't, I'm not going to be able to explain in detail here on this, on this webinar, but at the Navy level, we, you, we couldn't really see what, how we were performing overall in terms of subcontracting, because that's only reported at the DOD level. We could look at each individual contract, but you couldn't roll it up. Like you can roll up and say how much money the Navy spends as a whole and what percent is going to small businesses as prime contractors, but you can't do that when it comes to subcontracting. And so sometimes what you can't measure um, can isn't really monitored as well. Um, and like I said, the contracting officers are just so busy with everything. So if it's if it's something that's important to the to the federal government, to the um, organization, I think that there really needs to be one person ultimately at the top level that's responsible. And the, my recommendation would be that would be the head of contracts, and then it would flow down to the contracting officers because small business professionals are advisory only. We can advise and tell them you know, how we're doing or tell them about these audits, but to get contracting officers to make the changes, um, small business professionals can't do that. So like I said earlier, I think it's kind of like a hot potato and there's really not one person, one organization that's responsible. And I think that needs to change. Okay, great. And we'll check, we'll uh, edit the uh, the phone number and the typo on the, uh, the page here. Okay. So again, please, uh, yep. And John, over to you, do uh, Christian clauses flow down uh, such that they automatically appear, let me get this off my screen, in subcontracts? So the Christian doctrine is a doctrine in government contracts that says that if I, if a contracting officer has left a vital, important, special, super duper important clause to government contracting out of your contract, it will be read in. This originally was done with the changes clause. A contracting officer left the changes clause out of his contract. He needed to make a change and his prime said no. And then the courts said actually yes. These are important and they do not get flowed down into your subcontracts, even if they're even if you would think they would. So the changes clause can be read into your prime contract, but not your subcontract. Great. Okay, uh, and now it looks like we've got some questions, uh, looks like a good uh, seven or ten that have come in. Uh, so I'm going to read off. So the first one, they're going to read these, uh, and they're anonymous, so uh, I'm not going to call out anybody's name, uh, but I'll read them in the order that they uh, came in to us. Uh, so the first is, uh, what is the benefit of two primes being sim similarly situated? Uh, is it required or beneficial to have an agreement in place in those situations? And I'm not sure if uh, the person that typed this in wants to clarify anything as uh, two primes uh, being similar. Uh, maybe you're referring perhaps to one prime uh, being a subcontractor and the other one uh, taking more of the lead on the contract. Uh, unless any of the panelists have a better interpretation. I'm, uh, uh, I was thinking but, that that meant like if two women owned small businesses, if they're similarly situated and they're both women owned, they can team together and uh, meet the limitations on subcontracting. Okay. Um, they can prime, you know, like one company could do, you know, 30% of the work and another company could do, you know, 25% of the work, then they're doing 50% of the work and the rest is being subbed. Is that right, William? You're shaking your head. Yeah, you know, in the, that's in the category, correct. Right in the category, to meet the category, the 50% or 51% right. uh, in the category. It's similarly situation, similarly situated can split that up if they're truly similarly situated. 
um, to to address or to accommodate that 51 percent. So that's a big benefit, you know, and that's something that, you know, that's another thing that it's really important to respond to sources sought because the government is, you know, employee is trying to make a decision. Should I set this aside or not? Are there small businesses that can do it? And so let's say that, you know, a bunch of companies come in and, you know, but they, they don't really demonstrate that they can in their responses that they can do 50% of it, they're gonna to have to rely heavily on subcontracting, but because it's a big procurement. But if two similarly situated companies got together and in the response said, you know, we would team together and we would, that's how we would handle this limitations and subcontracting on this big procurement. I think if we did, if that more of that was done, more um, procurements could be set aside for small business. Great, it looks like John, you're shaking your head in agreement as well. Super, okay, let me move on to the next question since we do have uh, quite a few here. Uh, and William, this might be you based on what I'm reading so far. Given privity of contract, uh, how do you recommend a subcontractor handling the covered telecommunications uh, flow down, which is prohibiting the subcontractor from selling uh, the Huawei devices under any government subcontract? Uh, when that same subcontractor is being required to do so from another government prime and their lawyer got involved and approved it. Ooh. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a plate of spaghetti right there. Okay, so I mean, a, lot of, a lot of moving parts and I, I even dare to give a comment on that without having, a, you know, kind of a, additional uh, levels of understanding uh, and an appreciation of the nuances. Uh, I, I think the right answer is, it sounded like the right answer uh, was to get your lawyers involved. It, it may sound like that, that that answer didn't didn't come to the answer you were looking for, but that's always the right answer. When in doubt, and it gets to be a, a big plate of spaghetti, let, let the experts, you know, uh, uh, unnoodle it for you. I agree. I like <laughs> Don, anything to add here on a kind of a uh, legal that, perspective? I, I would have that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would have had to have read that question ahead in front of me in order to answer it any more in any more detail. Okay, great. Okay, then I will move on here to the next. Uh, and again, questions are anonymous, so feel free to, to uh, type them in at your leisure. Uh, okay, we are a small business staffing company. If we pay a fee of 15% of total award to a large business subcontractor to provide complete staff required for the contract, and then we pay all of those employees directly as W-2 or 1099, uh, are we complying with the less than 49% subcontracting rule here? Um, that seems to me like no, I mean, what the purpose of that rule, right, is to have the small businesses employees doing the work. And the way that question was read, it sounds like someone's trying to get around that. And that, um, I know the questions are anonymous, but look, that puts a bad taste in everyone's mouth about small business, right? right. Small businesses need to be the ones doing the work not trying to figure out how they can win a contract and give a pass through to somebody else to do the work to get around that um i wouldn't i mean that's how i interpret that question okay great okay and next is uh we have a gsa i'm assuming schedule uh but need to know the prime contracts in the engineering and it space especially working in texas how can we identify those primes um, I'm happy to answer, but if somebody uh, wants to chime in, please uh, go ahead. Well, I, I just think a way to find your primes in your space is to find the tribe of individuals that are, that operate, that either deliver, bring to market, or consume the goods and services you're seeking uh, to bring to market. Find that tribe then there's ways of doing that. Whitney mentioned a couple of ways of like getting on LinkedIn and putting thought leadership pieces out. And you'll be surprised how many people will connect and say, ah, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'd never heard of that before in my space. Finding your 
uh, your associations in your in your uh, you know different types of groups and affinity groups in those areas, and you'll be surprised. The people once you find your tribe and live amongst them for a while, you'll very clearly see who are the who are the heavies. You know the the, the folks that have the gravitas. Uh, business gravitas in the space. So I'm just a big believer. I don't think there's one, I wish there was a shortcut. I just don't think there's a shortcut to this. I think you have to live in the space, uh, understand the wants, needs, aspirations of the people in of the companies and, and providers and consumers in your vertical. Uh, it's like doing the homework. You have to do the homework in your vertical to know who the players are, but then you can find them and they will, you can either attract them, you can find them or they'll be attracted to you one way or the other. Yeah, yeah that, that's absolutely right, uh, William. And uh, a lot of the market intelligence tools that are out there uh, can also help you really kind of streamline that and find out, you know, you know who is out there. Uh, but, it, but you're right. You gotta, you gotta do the legwork. You gotta, you gotta get your, you know, your hands dirty and find out who they are, but you gotta introduce yourself as well to find out, you know, you know who's out there but also if there's also a connection that you can actually start working with them as well so gotta do the homework up front yeah but i'm going to answer the question in a very just direct and perhaps elementary way if you're just to the individual that sent the question and if you're just looking for the website to go to in the past it would have been the fpds site which is more or less uh sunset and has uh been migrated over to betasam.gov uh, again, betasam.gov, where you can uh, do searches for uh, past awards under the engineering NAICS codes, as well as the IT NAICS codes. You can then, uh, you'll get a, an enormous spreadsheet that you can filter by geographic location. So you can look for the contracts that are in Texas. Uh, you can also use some of the GSA websites uh, to determine who the vendors are within the engineering special item numbers as well as the IT, um, I'm assuming IT professional services, um, to look at those vendors. Uh, you can look at where they're headquartered, but that doesn't always mean that because they're based in Virginia or Texas, that they're only doing work in those states. That's where the beta SAM uh, or formerly FPDS would have come in handy. Um, let's move on here to the next question, which is, uh, do you have to flow down all of the FAR clauses, even if they don't apply to your specific business? I can answer that one. Um, read the clauses. Read actually read the clauses. They will tell you if they need to be flowed down. Not everything needs to be flowed down, um, but there will be clauses that say, "Oh, you have to flow this down." And if it doesn't make sense to flow it down, it won't make sense. But if it says flow it down, don't leave it out because uh, that's bad. You said you were going to flow it down. But yeah, read the clause. See if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense and it says flow me down anyway them down anyway great uh, and what's the best strategy to convince a contracting officer to request a set aside of five to ten percent of a large contract or large business that is at a source of thought level can you read that one more time sure what's the best strategy to convince a contracting officer to request a set aside of five to ten percent of a large contract slash large business that is at a sources sought level so i don't quite 100 percent understand the question but the sources sought goes out and they're they've got this big statement of work so i don't know if you're saying five percent of it break it out and make that a small business set aside or if you're saying that you know five percent of the work should be subcontracted to small business but either way when the contracting officers put out that sources sought um they're looking for information they're trying to develop the acquisition strategy they're saying we're not really sure based on some of our internal um look um you know it, at who's done the work in the past and stuff if we want to make this full and open or if we want to set it aside so but remember too that if they want to set something aside or break a piece out there has to be more than um, one company that can do the work you know because the government's looking for competition and so they're going to look at is it best to break it out is it best to go you know all to keep it all together um there's a lot of different decisions that come into play there i think one thing that you could do is is go talk if there's a particular situation that you're interested in go talk to the small business professional or talk to the contracting officer on that specific procurement 
right. and and I'll, I'll I'll add on to that. It's 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 you got to find out not only people in the acquisition process, but also people who are also dealing in that specific uh, source of thought. Like who are the other the program managers, the people on the government side? What does the stakeholder map actually look like? So you can also talk to them, saying like, hey, here's a reason why we want to have this as a you know grow out the small business plan or the subcontracting plan. So then they can work with the contracting officers. So understand everybody on the, the government spectrum so you understand how the, how you can make that convincing argument just don't know yeah. one person know as many people as possible yeah right. and jennifer I, the only thing i would add to that is um all of the all of the folks that were mentioned that are on the government acquisition team side are seeking to reduce risk all of them so if you can tell a compelling story that reduces risk you might get an audience the, the likelihood is greatly increased that you get an audience if you can articulate a story tell a compelling story that reduces risk to the acquisition yeah i was just working with a contractor who you know the based on the sources thought they thought it was going to go full and open they were really concerned they were going to write a letter and you know my advice would be if you're writing a letter look at it from the government's point of view why should they set it aside for small business not your point of view not to meet a small business goal that's not going to be a reason that they set it aside they're going to set it aside because they know that two or more small businesses can do the work and that they can be competitive and they can deliver a quality product um, but saying that you know you should set it aside because you're not meeting your women and goals or whatever that's not going to entice somebody um, any that whole acquisition team to set it aside right and I'm going to uh, chime in here with a quick answer because we still have a lot of questions to run through and I think we're at, okay, we've got some time. Uh, if you're looking at, if, you're, if the question was from the perspective of a small business wanting to be a sub to a large business and really thinking that this uh, source of thought is, you know, 99% geared to go to a large business, um, one of the common questions that we get from small business is, uh, how do we get the attention of the primes? You know, you tell us to bring them an opportunity because otherwise we're just going to look like every other small business flapping a capability statement in front of them, which isn't going to get you anywhere. Um, so when you do see the sources sought, uh, and there is some component of the work that you can do, that's when you should be uh, early in the stages, you know, start um, uh, building the relationship with the prime, going to, you know, the the usual suspects, the Lockheeds, the Raytheons, and, and so forth, and saying, hey, we've got this potential opportunity, it's early stage, but we can do A, B, and C, and you can do uh, the rest of the alphabet, you know, D through Z. Um, and that could be a, a good way to kind of uh, get a foothold in. Uh, and with that, I'm just gonna move on here. How does one decide which, clause, which FAR clauses to incorporate by reference and incorporate by full text? Um, as far as I can tell, it's basically random. Um, uh, so well, that's not true. Um, a lot of a lot of them will have alternate texts or will need to be revised somehow to make them make sense. Um, so a lot of those FAR clauses will will be altered slightly or will be written in a they'll be the clause from the FAR, but something in it will be changed so that it's applicable to this contract. And those will appear in text, but a lot of them will just be referenced because it's fine to bring them in as is. And some of them will be reproduced as is because that's what the contracting officer decided to do or how they do it at that agency or whatever. Um, but the if they're there by reference, go to the FAR, read the, slot, the clause. If they're there, like reproduced in text, read the version that appears in the text. Great, and then this one is geared specifically to you, Emily. So uh, Emily, agencies have been criticized for not enforcing prime subcontracting plans for many years. Uh, despite the negative audit, audits, many small businesses are skeptical about real change. Do you see any evidence the government is actually making a stronger effort to hold Prime's feet to the fire? I can tell you what what we did when I was with the Navy, and I and I think that they're still doing this. Um, and that is because I couldn't get a roll up report of, you know. We have contracts of 15 billion, I'm just gonna throw out a number, and the, on those contracts, this percent is being subcontracted out. We had to look at each individual contract. We figured out a way to come up and look at, you know, on our contracts, which um, we did a report, which 
what companies are meeting 80% of the goal that's in their contract. They're at the 80% mark and what companies are below 80%. And then we're gonna go after those companies and figure out why they're not at least meeting 80% of the goal that's in their contract. It was just a way to kind of take some sampling and to look at it and we figured 80% was a good number because you know if the contract's not done, they're not gonna be at 100%, but if the contract's halfway through and they're not even meeting uh, half their goal, then we're going to ask questions about that and look at it. That was something that the Office of Small Business Programs came up with, but we're not the contracting officer. So that's why I'm saying there's gotta be, I believe the contracting officers the, the head of contracts needs to be the one responsible. So I did, you know, take it to the head of contracts. We were we were working that, and I'm not sure how far along Jimmy Smith is, but I think that's one way of 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 making it visible. And actually, quite a few of them were meeting the 80% of the of the goal. And um, I can't say much about it, but I did sponsor three people when I was in the Navy office. There was three people that. Um, went to the Naval Postgraduate School and they just finished their thesis paper, which I reviewed and approved um, on subcontracting. And I know they're gonna be briefing it to Mr. Smith um, at some point, my predecessor. Um, that report is not gonna be made available to the public, I don't think, because there was a government contractor that was also on that team. But a lot of the findings were the same as what I said in those audit reports, but we did make some recommendations. And um, like I'm saying, one of my recommendations would be make somebody uh, accountable and, and um, make them responsible for that. That's what I would say. Um, Hopefully that answers the question. It's it's a big challenge when you look at everything that the government the government employees have on their plate, right? They're teleworking now. They're they we've got COVID. We've got all these different things, and it's a challenge sometimes to get um, a focus on small business subcontracting. Great. Uh, another thing, I'm just going to throw out a resource that uh, in case there are any newer small businesses on the uh, webinar today. Uh, the SBA puts out the uh, annual scorecard, which uh, will indicate and give each uh, department a letter grade on how well they uh, met their small business goals. Uh, and then they also rate the prime. So you can kind of get a, a feel for which agencies, um, you know, have the propensity to award contracts directly to small businesses and then who kind of needs to get their grade up and reverse engineer that into your strategy. And then, um, uh, same thing for the uh, for the primes within that uh, agency. So there's a ton of data out there. You really just need to use it. Uh, and the next question is, since we do not qualify as a small business uh, or any other designation, are there any tips on how to best approach primes to work with them? So I guess this business would technically be a large business and... Um, yeah. yeah, looking for tips on how to work with other with primes. I would say that uh, my recommendation is what makes you stand out? What makes you different? Why should the prime want to work with you? You know, like I tell small businesses all the time, don't go to the prime and say, I'm a small business. You've got to work with me. It's what makes your company stand out. What what can you do to help the prime? So I would say the same thing applies to a large business that wants to uh, be a subcontractor to a large company or even to another small business. You know, why should they want to team with you? Um, what, what what value do you bring? Yeah, and I'll add here, uh, if you are in fact a large business, as the question reads that they are not a small business, then why not look at uh, some of the successful 8As, hub zone, women owned, veteran owned, and, and all the other check boxes and form a mentor protege program so that way uh, that entity then is viewed as a small business. Uh, you've got as the large business the the muscle and the uh, the bandwidth and they've got the uh, the check box and, and hopefully some relationships. So uh, just a, a different thought there. Uh, are there any pathways to shift from subcontracting to prime contracts, especially with the same agency? Well, I, I would argue pathways is probably too strong of a word. I, that's organic growth, in, in my opinion. That is delivering well on the work that you have, 
realizing that you're in a sub relationship with a prime. So be very sensitive about, um, you know, um, marketing yourself in an environment where you aren't the prime, but having boots on the ground is a very competitive advantage that you get to hear it demand signals and pains. And if you are, if you are attuned to those and they're, they fall into categories where you can, uh, you know, wh where you go to market, there could be opportunities uh, from an organic perspective to listen to the pains and sometimes just the wants, needs, and aspirations of your current clients, but be very attuned to what you hear, what you're hearing on boots on the ground, and then take advantage of those opportunities of being close, close proximity. I'd also like to uh, poke, just stab in that a lot of people consider the GSA schedule program a way into becoming a prime, and I don't think that's always the best choice. Um, uh, it's it's a, it's one of the more administratively burdensome ways to become a prime. And it doesn't always have the same uh, payoff that just traditionally trying to bid the contracts can. Mm -hmm. I would also say, like, let's say that you're a sub to a, another small business, but that small business in when the contract ends is going to be a large business. That's something to be aware of, that they're going to be other than small. And the government is probably going to want to they're going to have a couple options. They're going to say, well, no other small businesses can do this work. So now it's going to have to be full and open competition, or you can work, be working with that prime and saying, you know, understanding that, you know, probably when this recompete comes out, you, your company is going to be other than small. We would like to prime it. Would you like to be our sub? Um, so kind of be thinking of that as a way to start um, develop a strategy for the next go around too. Yeah, I'd also just be cognizant of uh, any non-competes and um, uh, those sort of agreements. And uh, there's nothing that says that you cannot uh, directly respond to RFPs that are out there for small businesses. You don't need to be a sub. Your margins are going to be smaller. You're still going to have costs with the FAR flowdown clauses that John mentioned. Um, so why not just uh, go direct um, or have a multi-pronged approach until you're, you've got some of the past performance and the, uh, taking away the, the risk of doing business with your company again is really coming from that past performance and having a, a special skill and really focused on providing one specific service. Uh, Whitney, do you want to chime in on anything there? Or? Yeah, no, I, I was going to uh, add on and, and William touched on it, having boots on the ground, but also being very close to your client and and is there is there a strong relationship with your client because if you do go out and this is different different for every different type of market you know if you're do you have the bond for example if you're in the construction or, or infrastructure market do you have the bonding capacity to to do a prime type project at the you know whatever you know uh installation you're at i mean there's there's so many different uh dynamics to look at but you know does the client the end user do they want you to take it on or have you really ha made a, a great relationship over time that they would really like you to take it on or they're open to the idea? Don't go into it blindly and surprise them. Build a relationship, build the trust over time, you know, and, and show your subcontracting uh, past performance and build it. And then, then eventually, you know, it's, it's go into new territory, but definitely make sure you have an, a champion that will actually help you build that uh, that prime past performance and that that new prime uh, relationship. Great, and we're down to about ten minutes left, and still uh, quite a few questions coming in. So, which uh, are there any IDIQs or GWACs that enforce the subcontracting rules stringently? I don't know. Yeah. All of them should, you know, yeah. what, 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 whatever they are. They should, but you know, as, okay. as any of them being top of mind, I don't have any that are uh, top of mind. Okay. Yeah, same. Okay, a recent RFP required the Prime to provide information on how well they have met their small business goals in the past. Uh, this seems to be a new requirement. Is that your understanding? I think that that was always something that we looked at in terms of past performance. Um, on a competitive full and open. 
yeah, I think it's normal. Okay. Uh, on the GovWin by Dell Tech website, one report is for set aside opportunities. What does set aside mean? These are uh, competitions that are reserved for small businesses or other uh, socioeconomic categories. Right, and that's gonna be your women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, 8A, and, and all the rest. Um, can a prime use an individual as a proprietorship in meeting their small business goals? For example, can a consultant be considered to be a small business? What if the individual is a woman? Could she be considered a small business, woman-owned business? John, any thoughts on the, the legal aspect of that? Um, yes, if they meet the requirements. I mean, look at the requirements. You'd have to take a look at the business specifically, but if they meet the if they meet the requirements as SBA has it, they will. I, I don't remember them off the top of my head. There might be uh, something against a sole proprietorship. I don't think there is. Um, I'd have to look at it directly. But if they meet the requirements, I don't see why they wouldn't. Right. Assuming yeah, they're, assuming you're, you know, doing everything right and it's yeah okay uh we are a small nonprofit company uh far considers nonprofits not to be small businesses in our case we are less than 10 staff is there some special status that we can get not that i know of not that i know of it's very clear okay uh let's see here okay we do not have the capability to meet all of the requirements in an rfp uh how can we gain access to read the small business subcontracting plans for large business contracts containing uh small business set aside requirements does the government or prime make their small business con subcontracting plans available to the public uh, or to their internal suppliers vendors i don't think so i don't think they're available public they're supposed to be yeah they're supposed to be incorporated into the contract um as an attachment but when they publish that contract i don't even know if those are redacted or pulled off i mean i don't think that they are made public but oh. what the requirements are is in the RFP. Right. Requirements yeah. for subcontracting. But, but, but Whitney gave a really good, you know, um, response earlier that talks about getting into the being a part of the portal for any mm -hmm. large business that has multiple contracts. The portal will cover all of their activities. You know, so make sure you tap into their internal infrastructure that they're doing to vet for small businesses, especially uh, if they're a larger company that has multiple contracts. And and if and if this company uh, is going after a particular RFP, all of that information should be publicly available so they can see, you know, whatever that small business plan might be if it's a RFP really out on. The sorry uh, okay how much leverage i'm gonna mute in a second sorry how much leverage does the minority certification give you acquiring contracts with prime so if you're 8a women owned etc look what gives you leverage is that you have a product or service that is needed then the the prime has to meet you know is supposed to be meeting certain goals so they'll be interested but let's say you know, you're a company and there's another company that doesn't have those socioeconomic categories, but they have a better product. They're not going to go to you just because you are an 8A or whatever. They want the product or the service. That's what's got to make you stand out. What is it that you're offering? Great. Yeah, I agree. I think any certification is just the, the icing on the cake. You really need to have capabilities and past performance and obviously relationships. Um, I've often heard the government say that there's, you know, ample 8A companies, there's ample hub zone, there's ample veterans, there's ample women owned. Uh, the problem is finding those that have the past performance and the, the capabilities. Uh, okay, the next question, and I think this is the last one, uh, last question, we're probably right at the, the end here. 
Uh, most of my past performance is uh, working in the private sector. How does that uh, affect us as a government subcontractor? Or maybe how can that help them as a government subcontractor? I, I think it depends on the RFP, what the past performance requirements are in the RFP. Um, you know, it, it might be like if we're buying an airplane, it might say you have to have past performance um, supporting a, a program office that's an acquisition category, you know, C program. That's something that you can't get out in, you know, commercial world. So you wouldn't qualify. So you, just, you have to you have to look at what the RFP is saying in terms of what past performance they're looking for. And 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 I would also yeah talk talk with your prime talk to you talk to your. Uh, to, to the team that you're building and say, hey, this is what I want to put together. You, you got to have a, an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing relationship, you know, have that at open transparency because that's going to be critical, especially when past performance is going to be a, a, a huge part of what you're going to be uh, being judged on when the proposal actually gets submitted. So I think just have a conversation. It's a great starting point to see if it's even worthwhile. And like William said, you know, the, the government's looking to reduce risk. They need the contract to succeed. So if, you know, it, let's say that the work that you're, you have past performance in is IT and implementing some kind of, um, you know, software across a huge organization, and that's very similar to what the government's doing, you're going to mm -hmm. need to be able to communicate how it's similar because a lot of the government employees looking at what you've done aren't going to maybe understand how it's similar. So whatever you can do to explain how it is a similar contract and similar scope of work and how it you know is something that you can do and and do that translation for them that would be helpful right and i would also say if you're doing let's say on the private sector some work in supply chain and logistics then maybe the the natural uh a kind of dotted line over to the government might be something over at dla or uh, you know, some other agency that deals with, you know, supply chain and logistics. Uh, if you're dealing with, um, you know, IT and you're working, let's say, with uh, a medical company, then maybe the natural, again, dotted line is something over at HHS or NIH or something that's a related industry doing the same type of work. Um, I think you can, can make those parallels. Um, and so we'll go around the table here to, for any last uh, thoughts and we'll go uh, ladies first. So Emily, anything that you want to add before we conclude today? No, I think it was a good session. A lot of good questions and a lot of good answers. And so thank you for having me as a guest. It was great to have you. And uh, William, thank you also for being with us and any last thoughts? Yes, uh, recently I have been trying, I have been sharing with every government contracting officer and acquisition professional that I can uh, get an audience with to share the list of respondents for sources, sorts, and RFIs, to put that back out as, as information. While we're going through the process of touching all of those individuals, I would encourage all the government contractors, when you respond to your RFIs, request a list of the respondents. Who knows, there may be an opportunity for people to get together and, and make some synergistic matches there that a couple people can get together and they can eat the lunch of the big guy. So just think about that as a strategy. If, you, if they don't offer it, don't miss an opportunity to ask. You're guaranteed not to get what you don't ask for. Right, and uh, John? Thanks for having me. Everyone have a good weekend. Don't be afraid to read the FAR. And if you don't understand it, talk to your experts. Yes, or watch one of our videos on the uh, FAR. They're all complimentary. They're on our website and YouTube channel. Uh, Whitney, last but not least, great to have you and have that business development perspective. Any last thoughts? Yeah, no, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer, and the rest of the panel. This has definitely been uh, been great. Yeah, last thing I, I think is plan to play in the subcontracting uh, arena. Just don't shoot your, shoot from the hip here. You know, put out a, a strategy on how you want to go and approach approach uh, potential primes and how you want to be a subcontractor or vice versa. Only thing I recommend, and uh, and uh, that's all I have to say. So thank you and have a great weekend. Super. Thanks, everybody. Uh, any of the attendees have uh, additional specific questions for any of the panelists or for me? We've got all the contact information here. 
we're going to get you the PowerPoint and the recording, uh, hopefully by Monday. Um, and again, thanks to the panelists. I know you guys uh, put a lot of time and effort into the content and a lot of thought into providing great answers to the questions that came in. Uh, thanks to the attendees for making time today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Next month, we're covering sales and capture. Uh, the registration list or link is on our website. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Well.